Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for a conversation with Karen Sawyer McElmurray, Laya Hampton, and Annette Sinook Clapsaddle. My name is Talia, and I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf. Welcome to our 2021 event season. Before we begin, let me just take a moment to bump some upcoming events that I'm excited about. Uh, next week, we're hosting journalist Lee Vanderboo for her book about climate change and the legal fights that activists use to combat it. That book is called As the World Burns. Um, so in the following week, we're hosting Nashville-based author Ed Tarkington for his new novel, The Fortunate Ones, which is about wealth and Southern society. I encourage you to check out our Crowdcast profile at the top of your screen where it says Flyleaf Books. You can click that and see our full lineup of events, um, although we are still continually adding to that. For the coming months, you can subscribe and then you'll get notifications um, when we add events. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and our guests, please keep in mind that we do have all of the titles that we're featuring tonight available for purchase. You can click the green link below our faces and that will take you to the Flyleaf website where you can buy all of those titles. We are currently closed for browsing, but you can order online or over the phone. And if you've already bought the books, but you'd like to support uh, programming at the store, there is a donate button at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate any amount, just a few dollars. If that's what you'd like to contribute, uh, that does help us out to continue offering programming and bringing authors to talk to you. All right, thanks for your patience. While I got through that admin stuff, I will go ahead and introduce our authors now. First up, Annette Sanook Clapsaddle is an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and she holds degrees from Yale University and the College of William and Mary. Her work, Going to Water, won the Morning Star Award for Creative Writing from the <clears throat> sorry from the Native American Literature Symposium and was a finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. She is co-editor of the Journal of Cherokee Studies and serves on the Board of Trustees for the North Carolina Writers Network. Her new novel, Even As We Breathe, was published in September 2020. She resides in Kuala, North Carolina. Leah Hampton, our second author featured tonight, writes about Appalachia, corpses, and eco-anxiety, and smart women. Her debut collection, and I'm going to swear, so don't have your audio on if you have kids around, her debut collection, Fuckface and Other Stories, was released by Henry Holt in 2020. She graduated from the Missioner Center for Writers and has been awarded UT Austin's Teen Prize for Literature, the James Hurst Prize for Fiction, and the Doris Best Prize. She has held several, several fellowships and her work has appeared in publications including Ecotone, McSweeney's, and Story South. She lives in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And our third author featured tonight, Karen Salyer McElmurray is a writer whose memoir, Surrendered Child, A Birth Mother's Journey, was an AWP award winner for creative nonfiction. She has also penned several novels, The Motel of the Stars and Strange Birds in the Tree of Heaven, which won the Chaffin Award for Appalachian Literature. She has co-edited with poet Adrian Blevins an essay collection called Walk Till the Dogs Get Mean, Meditations on the Forbidden from, Con from Contemporary Appalachia. Wanting Radiance, her newest novel, was released in April 2020 from University Press of Kentucky. All right, so we'll, before we begin the conversation, we'd like to give everyone watching a quick taste of each of these authors' work. Uh, Karen, could you start us off? If you don't mind, briefly introduce your book and then set the scene for your readings. Jump in whenever you are ready. Well, hello, everyone, um, and many thanks to um, Talia Smart and Flyleaf Books for having us here this evening. And most of all, I'm just so thankful to have the chance to share this conversation with two women writers whose work I admire so very, very much, Leah and Annette. I am going to start, out, start us out by reading briefly from my still somewhat new novel, Wanting Radiance, which came out in April 2020 from uh, University Press of Kentucky. Oh, this novel started some 10 years ago, and I worked on it in drafts for about seven years. But it began those 10 years ago when I visited a fortune teller um, who lived outside of Weaverville, North Carolina. I was then uh, quite lovelorn and was seeking answers. And this woman lived 
in a trailer. She was this enormous woman who lived in a bed, you know, a tra in the back room of the trailer in this big bed with a velvet headboard. And you went in and you had photographs read. She looked for the shadows in photographs. So that was the beginning of this book, but it took so many turns, so many different roads. And it had, I, I'd say it's about tarot cards. It's about ghosts. It's about haints. It's about lost love and found love. But most importantly, it's about the search for a self. One of the main characters in this book's name is Miracell Loving. And she is a 30-something-year-old uh, roadie. She travels here and yon, telling false fortunes to make a living. She, what she remembers most vividly in her life is a time when she was almost 16 years old, um, when she witnessed her mother, whose name is Ruby Loving, um, being shot on a night she was uh, telling fortunes for someone. And all Miracell could see were shadows behind drawn curtains. She's also never known her father, and she has a heartfelt belief that it was her father who shot her mother. So this novel is a journey for Miracell, a journey toward not only um, finding out who shot her mother, but her own identity. She doesn't, she's adrift in time and place and self. I'm gonna read you a couple of pages from about mm, two thirds of the way into the book. Here, Maricel has traveled to a small place called Inez in eastern Kentucky, and there she has sought out down a, a man named Leroy Loving. At that time, she believes Leroy is her father, and he is not. He's her grandfather, and he takes her to this trailer where many of her mother's things were stored. And so this passage is about looking through things. If anybody here has lost a loved one, you're very well, very uh, well aware of how much power there is in ordinary objects. Those objects are resonant. So here is Miracell looking through things in this trailer, looking for the identity at this point of her father and the lost past of her mother. I had no idea what I'd find, but I looked for it. I opened kitchen drawers, pried a warm beer loose from a plastic ring six pack on the fridge's top shelf, sipped. I poked into cabinets and shelves, nooks and crannies. Finally, the hideaway spaces beneath a bed, behind a broke spring couch. I found papers galore, old warranties on radios and hair dryers, postcards with scrawled signatures. Having a good old time there, sugar pie? Well now. Way back on the top of the stove, folded into the shape of a sailor's hat, were pages from a magazine, part of a short story that I read as I sat on the floor with a flashlight. We wandered through streets and streets, past houses that smelled crisply of ginger. I opened cardboard boxes, rooted through piles of this, piles of that. I even bowed open the jackets of record albums I found leaning against one wall. Frank Sinatra, Guy Lombardo. What I wanted but couldn't find were pictures of her, my mother, Ruby Loving. Pictures back in the day before I was even born. I dug through a toolkit from underneath the kitchen sink, found baby food jars full of rusty screws and nails, coffee tins full of snips of wire a small metal box full of bullets, three of which I pocketed just in case. I found an old fiddle case full of empty motel room sized whiskey bottles underneath a wild animal smelling mattress. I, I found a near empty closet, empty but for a mouse trap baited with a dried up slice of cheese. I climbed up on a milk crate to have a look in the closet shelf. The box was cumbersome, but I lugged it down, sat on the edge of the bed beside it. On top, two scrawled words, her things. Her things were tossed in without rhyme or reason. A bunch of beaded bracelets held together with twine, a toy harmonica, a sheet from a diner with the daily specials, ham, red-eye gravy. Underneath it all, a red velvet box covered in cobwebs. I shook it, hearing what I imagined were dime store earrings and lipsticks, 
ruby things I knew the way I knew my very own hands. As I eased the lid open, what I saw first were rose petals, and beneath them, a box of tarot cards. On the front, a woman in a robe with foxes and griffins. Beneath the deck, a pair of glossy black and white photos. A tiny child stood by a tree in some yard. I turned that photo over and back, craving more. And I suddenly remembered a mulberry tree. There was the one by the trailer when we'd li where we'd lived that night she was shot. But this one was farther back in my memory. Its long, seedy fruits were blackish, purple, and sweet. Don't you eat them things now, some voice said inside me as I looked at the picture. Mulberries are food for the birds. The voice was older than Ruby's, my grandmother's maybe, though I'd never known her. The other photograph made my heart do a lurch. It was Ruby, a Ruby I'd never seen. Inside of my fortune-telling mother, this was nothing but a girl, her black hair combed, a flip of bangs across a forehead. Underneath the photos, a paper tablet decorated with glitter, the shapes of moons and stars and planets. A half sheet was glued to the front of the tablet, and on it was big, clumsy handwriting, a girl script, the near hearts of O's, the tales of Y's. Ruby Loving, her property, it said. I remembered what my mother looked like, her jotting down spells and potions in that notebook. But this was a girl's diary. Her dreams it was full of drawings of cats made of circles, drawings of big fat moons, and in between her loopy handwriting, telling about her days. Near the bottom of the box, beat up pages from an old atlas. I spread them across my lap and looked at the interstate lines going west then at the empty spaces of a map of New Mexico, a single town leading to a single town, and there in the flat of nothing at all, my mother's handwriting, a circle and a heart drawn around the name of that town, Willet. And last of all, a couple of letters tied up with ribbon. I sat with the letters and the velvet box in my lap a long while, then unfolded one more thing, a single sheet of notebook paper, four lines only. Come back to me, she said. My heart has gone out and is wandering the earth in search of you. Were you ever here, Russell Wallen? Or were you some ghost man I wanted to be real? My fingertips circled the loops and lines of the name, a shadowy red lipstick kiss, my daddy's name. Wow, thank you so much for reading that, Karen. Um, all right, our next author to introduce is Leia Hampton. Uh, if you don't mind, just introduce your book, set the scene for whatever you're gonna read and then jump in whenever you're ready. Hey everybody, thank you. Thank you, Talia, and thank you, Karen. That was beautiful. Um, I love this book that we're talking about tonight. I'm really glad to be here with these two amazing Appalachian women and a big thanks to Flyleaf Books also, as Karen said, just seconding everything she said. So um, my book is called Fuck Faith. And um, if you haven't already uh, had the opportunity to you know, give that as a gift to someone at Christmas and see their face when you open it up, um, you know, Valentine's Day is coming, so you could wrap it up, and that might be fun. Um, but it's it's not a dirty book at all. It's very um, uh, very tame, and it's twelve short stories all about Appalachia. It takes place in different places in Appalachia, different people. They're not connected stories, but they're all unified by um, basically really just talking about kind of the modern women's experience of Appalachia, um, kind of trying to bring us into the twenty first century, especially to to, to um, shed light on our in our relationship with the environment and our interdependence with our ecology because we have a lot of environmental issues here so it's about that the the land acting upon us and how we act upon the land um so i'm going to read just a the opening from a story most of these stories you can find in different um journals and some of them are online if you want to take a look at some of them 
uh, I'm going to read one that uh, that hasn't found a home that's just in the book and it's not published anywhere. It's called Wireless. And um, I'm just going to read the opening scene and I'm going to skip a little bit so I'm not so I don't read for too long. So if, if there's information missing, just assume that these two people have a lot of sexual tension. Just go with that and that'll fill in the details for you. So this is from Wireless. The Holiday Inn Express on Richland Skyway seemed like as good a place as any for Margaret Price to maybe possibly stick her finger up a guy's butthole. At least somebody had asked her to. People didn't ask Margaret for anything, let alone sex stuff. Margaret's sister Julie got asked out by men all the time and people were always calling her for recipes and beauty tips. Men probably wanted Julie to do all kinds of things to their assholes. Her whole life, Margaret watched Julie field requests, yesing and knowing however suited her, and she wondered what it was like to be so spoiled for choice. For Margaret, this butt finger in question was a real opportunity, so she wanted to make sure she handled it right. How it happened was, Margaret went to her 15-year high school reunion and bumped into Robbie Barnwell. After work on a Saturday, after Julie reminded her a dozen times, she put on a dress that felt papery from being so rarely worn, and she drove to the First Baptist Church's Fellowship Hall across from Bentley High School. She only went to, say, to stop Julie dogging her to say she'd survived. Margaret slunk along the periphery until she came to a snack table, and she's there now, um, a snack table in the back corner by a big rectangular window. Someone handed her a paper plate, which she gripped, double-handed. She noted a few faces she recognized, then looked out the window at her car. She decided she would go home in exactly 11 minutes, which she began to count off in her head in sets of 20 seconds. She'd nearly reached the end of the second minute when a voice behind her said, well, hey there, Margaret Price. Robbie Barnwell was scooping punch into a red plastic cup right next to her. She recognized him immediately and felt no shock, as if he were a landmark she passed every day on her way to work. She said, hey, Robbie. They got to talking, and Margaret asked about Trina Bagshot, which was who Robbie had married right after high school. She's all right, Robbie said, working for the state now. Y'all still together? She didn't ask with any hope. She was just asking. The snack table was covered in white paper and laden with pretzel sticks and fruit trays. A sagging blue banner above them said, Welcome home, Mustangs. Margo, Margaret and Robbie had been decent friends all through school, never beat each other up, never kissed, helped each other pass algebra. There was mutual respect. Fourteen years, said Robbie. Kids, said Margaret. Just one, he said. He fished out his phone and showed her a picture of a lanky kid holding a soccer ball. He's going to be 13. Margaret said, my nieces, they're littler than that. Somebody announced a quilt raffle to benefit the marching band, and the music switched to an old song about not wanting it to rain. What about you, he said. You get married or anything? Margaret knew that Robbie knew she wasn't married. Everybody knew, but it was nice of him to ask. Margaret shook her head. Well, you look good. You seeing anybody? Margaret shrugged. I just focus on my career. Uh, let's see, I'm skipping apart. Um, Robbie said, well, you sure left town in a hurry after school. Maybe, maybe, are you making good money down there in Knoxville? Nope, said Margaret. He held his cup halfway to his mouth and gave her an eyebrow. You get fired? I quit, said Margaret. Came back home last fall when Julie's divorce was final. You remember my sister? Sure, Robbie said, I remember Julie. He didn't smile or say the name with any energy, and Margaret felt her abs loosen. He wasn't going to ask how Julie was, if she was still a looker, all the questions men usually had. He didn't care about her sister. Julie wasn't the reason Robbie was talking to Margaret. They were just talking, like they used to in algebra class. Well, anyhow, now I manage the GameStop on Richland Skyway, Margaret said. She picked up a cheese blob on a toothpick and added, I stopped giving a shit about a lot of stuff a while back. Robbie was wearing a bright blue dress shirt, no tie. I know the feeling, he said. I didn't get a fancy career or anything. It was Margaret's turn for an eyebrow. Electrician, he said. I am a lineman for the county. Margaret smiled. She hadn't done that to anybody in a long while. Robbie said, ain't we a pair? That's it. <laughs> Well done. And 
what an opening sentence. <laughs> All right, and last up, we've got Annette. So now, clap, saddle. Uh, why don't you introduce your book, uh, set the scene, and then jump right in. All right, thank you uh, for having me. And, and just like um, the other two ladies tonight, I want to thank Flyleaf for hosting us. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with both of these writers. Um, I devoured both of, of your books, so um, this should be fun tonight. And I just wrote myself a note never to follow Leia when she does a reading about buttholes um, ever again. <laughs> It's really hard to pick up from that point. <laughs> but I, um, so a little bit of background about uh, Even As We Breathe. Um, it was published by University Press of Kentucky this past fall. Um, and the, the story is set in 1942. And there are, are two places where it takes place, really. Um, the first is at the Grove Park Inn um, in Asheville, North Carolina. And the Grove Park Inn held access diplomats and foreign nationals as prisoners of war uh, one summer, uh, 1942. And then the other main setting of the novel is in Cherokee, North Carolina. And that's where the protagonist, County Sequoia, is from. He's a 19-year-old young man um, who's just really trying to find his way um, deciding whether he wants to maybe go to college. And so he goes to work at the Grove Park that summer. And he's joined by Essie Stamper, a young woman from Cherokee, who he knows of, but they don't know each other very well until they get to the end. And then they, they form a really unique relationship. While they are working at the inn, County is accused of being involved in the disappearance of a diplomat's daughter. So he is um, he is trying to defend his innocence um, while he's in Asheville. And then also um, he's sorting through some um, family uh, secrets and mysteries back home as well. So um, it's really a story about uh, the relationships we have um, both the chosen relationships we have and then the ones that, that sometimes we don't uh, get to choose. So I'm, I um, am excited to read tonight because, you know, I knew I was going to be with, with some uh, incredible Appalachian women. And um, one of my favorite characters in the book is Essie. And she's a bone of contention for some folks who have read the novel because you either love Essie or you hate Essie. And I had a colleague who stopped in her tracks. I, I teach high school. She stopped in her tracks as she was rounding a corner and looked at me and she stared me right in the eye and she said, I hate Essie. <laughs> that was one of the nicest compliments I've gotten about my writing because I just want you to feel for her one way or the other. Um, so I, I selected um, chapter four from the novel. Just uh, I'm going to pull out pieces, different segments from four. Um, that, that give you a sense of, of County, my protagonist, um, but also of Essie um, and her complexity um, as a Cherokee, a young Cherokee woman. So uh, this is when they're going to ride together to Asheville for the first time to go work at the Grove Park. And County's very nervous um, about this trip. Any other background you need is that Leashy is County's grandmother and Bud is uh, County's uncle. I, I think everything else is self-explanatory. So the rattling gear shifts seem to rise between us, expanding into a border separating our two worlds. She smelled of lavender and honeysuckle, a scent that defied all boundaries and invaded my awareness. So I rev the engine, forgetting what my uncle had taught me. Clutch is clutch, damn it. Despite my nervousness around her, we had practically grown up together caught in the slow churn of the Koala Boundary, tiny Cherokee, North Carolina, hours away from Asheville, the nearest city anyone could call such. We were products of the reservation, pronounced low and quick by us, reservation, broken into at least five whispered syllables when spoken by visitors or neighbors across the mountain, the reservation. We were, count, we were cousins of cousins, 
cousins or something like that, Lishi often recalled, a classification less about tree branches and more about confined, timeless existence. Of course, I instinctively knew who she was. I was fairly certain I knew who she would become. Watching her was like watching a summer storm's lightning charge, the flash that illuminates the sky. She was the bolt that strikes fast across the horizon, downward toward its target, an unsuspecting lone tree whose roots are no longer its security, but rather become the very circuit for which the charge swells. The energy's force overcomes everything idle and ordinary, and you know it from the moment the air vibrates with warning thunder. Her future, everything that would come after her 19-year-old reality was too powerful for most of us to follow. I knew this the first day I saw her, over a decade prior to our trip. She was a child of maybe seven or eight playing in the cool shallows of the Oconalefti River, downstream from where I fished for speckled trout and dug ruddy crayfish from beneath mossy rocks. Her goldenrod skirt was hiked up to just above her scarred knees and dark strands of hair fell ragged along the slopes of her downward peering face. She too was searching for fish, but not to snare as I had set out to do. While I was dedicated to their capture, she was more concerned with studying the free movement of the fish that maneuvered past her stick thin legs. Out of a patient stillness, she darted after a quick moving knotty head, marveling at its agile speed, then snatched it from the water only to release it immediately. Within minutes by the river, I had slipped on the filmy rocks and busted my ass. I was soaked. Though she took far fewer precautions, she never fell. She never even seemed to come unbalanced. Skip a little bit. I hope the preacher man did not provide Essie with an overview of my own background, which would include a failed attempt at Oak Ridge Junior College, an institution I'd only been accepted into as recognition of my father's World War I service and been able to afford with federal relief aid dollars. In the last year of my 19-year-old existence, working odd jobs in Cherokee, I coveted this opportunity to introduce myself on my own terms to present the county detached from family binds or awkward tales of my fumbling youth. Though I was unsure if she had any impression of me at all, I wanted desperately to craft one for her. I wanted us to be intimate confidants, as if we'd shared years of inside jokes, had nicknames for each other, could speak without vocalizing words. I wanted to assume that Lishi's recollection of being distant cousins was merely the ramblings of an aging grandmother, insistent that the whole damn reservation was related. I wanted to speak to her like I'm speaking to you now, I wanted her to have never heard anyone else's opinion of me, save perhaps my mother's and Jesus Christ. My early, I'm skipping some too. Uh, my early impressions of her could have been wrong. Maybe all those years ago, she wasn't scowling down at the river, but shielding the summer sun from her eyes so that she could better locate fish. Walking into town alone, speaking to no one was not chosen isolation. Maybe she was concentrating on the shopping list streaming through her head, or like me, she feared straying too far from explicit instructions, leading to an inevitable whipping, maybe even beating. For me, it was the difference who sent me, Lishi or my Uncle Bud. For Essie, maybe there was no option. Regardless of how I justified her coolness, I wanted to believe that I had something to do with her warming. I wanted to believe that years ago I had distracted the fish in the river so they all swam her way. I wanted to believe that my shying away from the beautiful girl in the trading post allowed her to complete her purchase with accuracy. I was her space to breathe, her freedom to warm in the margin I left for sunlight. Silent clapping ensues. Um, thank you all so much for, for for setting up your books, introducing us to these characters, and giving a brief reading. Um, before um, 
we have a conversation. I'm just going to kick things off. And then to keep the focus on y'all, I'm going to minimize my video. So it's the three of y'all on screen. So I'm going to start by jumping right in with a question for Annette. How do you feel that place and specifically Appalachia informs your writing? What role would you say that that space and place plays for you? I, you know, I think in general for my writing, it's incredibly important. Specifically for this book, um, it is almost completely set it, setting driven um, in its concept. Um, if it wasn't for um, the history of what was going on at the Grove Park um, and, and thinking about those spaces of this very high class resort um, as a place for foreign nationals and U.S. military uh, to mingle, then, you know, I, I feel like I wouldn't have had the space for the narrative where I wanted to kind of up the heat and, and bring in um, a Native character to talk about how all of these complex identities um, work together in Western North Carolina, in Appalachia, um, and I think it's something people don't think about very much. A lot of times um, we think about Appalachian communities in isolation from each other. Um, and so I was really interested in, in how they mingle together. Um, you know, I've, I've I think we may have a question later on that kind of uh, gets to this as well, but um, Native American um, literature oftentimes um, in, in the past has um, created an, an inaccuracy that there is some kind of innate spiritual connection to the environment. And that is a stereotype that I am adamant um, to push against. Um, but my approach to that is, is to let it rise to the surface and, and push to the edge of what that really is, and then maybe shed light on um, the fact that it's it's not this innate relationship to the environment. It is a relationship that our community has to the environment because we have been here for tens of thousands of years and have uh, lived on this land and survived on this land. And so in order to do that, you have to understand this land. That is very similar to um, all of our Appalachian neighbors. And so I think that, you know, you can't really be from this area and rooted in this area without having some kind of understanding um, of the environment. So it, there, there's no way I could write without it. So, I don't, you know, I toss it over to my friends here to see what they have to say. I just think it's so interesting that you and I, most of my book takes place not far from where your book takes place. And yeah, I, I see it, see characters being so defined by topography. And uh, I think I just would echo a lot of what you said that, that so much of what my book was about was not about, you know, woo woo stuff, but more about just the direct impact that we have which is often not positive. Like these are not all good buttholes y'all and um, terrible things happen and we do terrible things to the land and the land can do terrible things to us um, when we abuse it. And that can become, you know, it's not always like a positive, um, uh, that stereotypical thing of like, oh, you know, everybody goes and gardens and hunts and everything's perfect when you're out in nature. So just, I would second a lot of what Annette said. Yeah, it's very similar for me. What about you, Karen? Um. Um, I guess I will answer the question in relation to self and Appalachia in a more personal sense. I think that in many ways, uh, I am Mira Cell Loving. Mira Cell Loving is a roadie. She's lived everywhere and nowhere. And that's been a lot of my own experience. I counted not long ago. And at this point, I've, li I've moved in my life maybe 40 times. 
Yeah, I know. And that's, <laughs> that's hard to believe. I've lived in Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky. I've lived all over and nowhere. And I, I really believe there's a term from a writer I like a lot who's a theologian and philosopher, and he calls it axis mundi, which is sacred space. And I, I feel myself always in this great sort of everywhere and nowhere of my of myself coming back to and coming back to the place that made me and my ancestors. That place, strictly speaking, is gone now. Uh, Highway 23 came through and took Hager Hill, took um, the land that was my great grandfather's, um, took the graves of my ancestors on that land. But still, that's the place I come back to. And I come back to it psychically and artistically. I come back again and again to those ancestors. Some of my first work, a book that was never published, it was called The Black Shaped Wonder. And it was uh, stories that I rewrote, I rewrote, having heard them again and again from my grandmother and my great grandmother. Those are stories that are deeply, deeply set in me, ones I need so badly. So that's been my experience on the deepest level of coming from the mountains and longing for the mountains. I don't all think, I mean, that's it's so interesting. But it, it's so interesting that you're talking about not being here and yet still feeling really connected to it. And I heard Lee Smith talk about this a while back. She talked about um, uh, how when, you know, she writes about her experience was writing about her experiences growing up and she said the moment that I made the decision to write about the people that I grew up with I sort of stepped outside the circle and I wasn't in the circle anymore so I think that I don't I think that there's something to be said for that because you know I'm only half and I'm I live here and my family's here and and uh and my father's family is very deeply rooted here but my other half is is foreign and my mother is british and I've lived overseas and i moved around a lot too and i think that actually helps me to kind of stand outside of it um, so i'm yeah and i wonder about that with annette too if there's if you, where how do you get distance from the place if you're gonna be so so rooted in especially when you're as you said you're trying to reflect the diversity of who's here I mean, I, just to respond quickly to one thing there i feel so much an outsider in many ways as a woman i never really fit with the people i come back to somehow i'm like a foreigner i mean i went on to school people don't really get that they always say you know you've gotten above your raisin <laughs> well, I'm both above my raisin and, and looking for my raisin all at once, you know, especially as a woman. <laughs> and yeah, no, I think that's an interesting thing to to think about. Um, I was I was sitting here and it, it reminded me of my my first manuscript that is also not published. I know that feeling um, is loosely based on. Um, Kind of the the story of my grandfather on my um, on my dad's side, my Cherokee side, and he was a two term chief and a heavyweight wrestling champion of the world. Um, so he was an interesting uh, character. And I used to hear all of these um, you know tall tales about him. When I meet people uh, who knew him, they always love to tell me these stories. And the truth is, none of them jive. I mean, even the stories from my family, it doesn't. It doesn't jive. And so I really, when I wrote that, I set out to understand him um, from a, from almost like a base level, not, not necessarily like a truth level. What is the truth of every detail of his life, but more so what would motivate somebody like this or what kinds of experience would someone like this have? And so I think that, you know, I self distanced myself. Uh, when I wrote that, because I, I turned towards fiction as opposed to nonfiction. Um, and then, uh, you know, Leia, your question kind of made me think about it. I wonder if that's why I um, lean toward historical fiction with this novel, that that created that distance for me instead of um, writing, uh, you know, in a contemporary setting. And now it makes me really nervous because what I'm writing right now is set in contemporary Cherokee and it talks about politics and I'm I may need to come stay with one of y'all for a while. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, do it. Do it. We'll make it. We'll make a residency for you in the basement. I would love you both to come here, and we will sit up all night and talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. If it's okay, like another question that I think is so important to me that relates to all that we're saying: How does your family, either uh, immediate or extended, how do they respond to your life as a writer and to the work? Do they read your work, and do they get upset when they read your work? Or, I mean, in my case. Uh, most of them don't read a lot and you know I, I mean that's honestly true they'll get book, like I once I gave my mother when she was still alive a box set of Gone with the Wind and its sequel and she kept it in the plastic and put it on a shelf and you know and put flowers around it was like an arrangement or something and so she did not read my memoir which is I mean they're pulling all the stops out and it's about you know having being a birth mother and surrendering my child when I was 15 and right. she didn't even know that it had occurred until the yeah. time. And so, um, it, you know, there's a lot of, I don't think people don't quite know what to make of me, I guess. But do y'all have that experience? I don't know. I'm, I want to hear Annette's answer to this one. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, if, I, I have been fortunate that I feel like my uh, community has been super supportive um, and folks that that may not necessarily read everything that come come out. I've, you know, I've kind of been pleasantly surprised with, um, you know, trips to the grocery store and whatnot. And somebody who will come up to me and say they read it. Um, it's a little terrifying sometimes when, you know, when they approach you and they're like, I read your book and it's just like a flat face um what they're gonna say but my uh my dad um <laughs> I got an agent recently and my dad's really upset because he considers himself my agent and so for years he has always been a big fan and it's funny because he read you know one of the earliest drafts um of the novel and you know your dad's never gonna say anything bad about you know what you write well I, my dad is not gonna say I think not gonna say anything bad but um, it was funny when he, he read the final version and it was almost like a surprise, like, oh, you're doing this for real. This isn't, you know, you, you writing in a journal anymore. So, um, he's been really sweet and supportive about it. Um, my, my husband reads, um, a lot of nonfiction. He's a former history teacher. Um, and so his approval of a, of a fiction, a work of fiction was really uh, important to me and my my boys I have a seven-year-old and a 12 year old and they both re refuse to read it um, <laughs> um, even though I think they, they probably could um, even the seven-year-old at this point but um, I you know I haven't I guess again it's like that distance that I've provided myself with it being historical fiction I think has made it um, you know, easier, you know, I don't, I get really, I only get nervous about uh, being checked for historical facts or things like that. That makes me the most nervous. Um, even though I've done, you know, I've done that, the press checked it. Um, I know there's one error in the book, historically speaking, um, you know, it's fiction. So what, right. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, being that, that's what makes me the most nervous. Um, I'm rambling on, but I do, you know, my community has been super supportive. So I haven't had any of those um, instances where, where people are mad about what I wrote yet, yet. What about you, Leah? I haven't had anybody get mad because I don't think anybody that I'm related to by blood has read it. I don't think, I don't think any of my, neither on my uh, mother's side or on my father's side. I just think that, um, uh, for like for my mother's family and for my mother's was too close. Like she doesn't want to, she said she doesn't want to read it because um, it'll, it'll make her sad and she doesn't want to be sad about, you know, things that she thinks, even though they're fictional, I might've had to go through or something like that. Um, and then for everybody else on that side, you know, they don't really understand this place. And so I think they read it and just go, yeah, I still don't get you. Cause I'm the only person in my family who talks like this, right? Like everybody else has a British accent. And then, um, and then for my dad's family, all my cousins on that side and stuff, um, 
I just don't see them enough to know. And I don't think they would tell me if they liked it or if they did like, or if they didn't. I just think they're like, like it's, I have a very reserved family. So my chosen family, which is like writers in the region and, and, and people that, um, that I have tried to, you know, gather around myself, they've been super supportive. Um, but yeah, it's interesting for me just about that, that distance thing, because, because I do feel very much like you, Karen, where I'm a stranger to the people that are familiarly closest to me in terms of, especially the creative work that I'm producing. But then this place that I live in, you know, I'm not like, like, I don't eat y'all. I don't eat soup beans. I don't like soup beans. Soup beans was a thing I tried to avoid when I was a child because there's not how, you know, that's soup beans to me is we're broken. It's the end of the month. I'm not eating soup beans. <laughs> I'm doing it. You know, it's the kind of stuff that I, that I want, wanted distance from when I was younger. And now I'm trying to get back to. So there, yeah, there's a lot of tension there, I guess. Maybe that comes out in what I write, but it certainly comes out in yours, Karen. She's muted again. You have to. I'm muted again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would be remiss and if I didn't say that my most supportive person in terms of my writing, supportive and also just really complex relationship, my father, he passed away in February and he was the one who always wrote. I mean, I have here on the shelf, you know, a, a stack like this big of stories that he wrote many of them like going to Heinemann. He loved writing and uh, he encouraged that in me. He took me to the library in a, in, a, in a strange, difficult childhood. He was the one who took me to get the books. On the other hand, it was complicated, you know, continuing with the gone with the wind thing. And then he would read what I'm writing now and he would say, you know, what you really need to do is write a modern gone with the wind. And I, I couldn't quite know what to do with it. <laughs> I'm thinking, hmm, how I think that that would go. Just <laughs> so <laughs> then, on. I would write what I write, and he would be just sort of bewildered by it, you know. And as far as the memoir goes, he at the he knew what it was going to be, and he he wanted it to be fiction, and that was not what it needed to be. <laughs> um, yeah, I should I should say too that my family loves me, and they're very supportive. It's not. Like I yeah. have good relationships. It's just that I think they think I'm a little weird for what I do. That's all. But my husband and everybody, they're all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> they love me, but I'm sort of, you know, yeah. tolerated or something sometimes. Yeah. Or she goes so again. I get a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> what did anybody else in your family write? Uh, did, it, did you have parents that wrote or anything like that? Somebody asked me that question the other day. Um, and I'm just interested. Does anybody else in your family write? Are you asking me? Yeah, Leah. Mm -hmm. um, no, there's musical people in my family and very creative people in my family. I have, um, you know, I have a cousin who's a really wonderful painter. I have um, uh, my father and my grandmother were musicians, um, but not writing. No, not really. Not that I know. I just have to ask if it's okay, this question, another question. Uh, this is, Leah, I read that essay that I fell in love with in Guernica, Lost in a Misgendered Appalachia, and I just love this phrase, talented, hellacious women. Would you, <laughs> could y'all tell, do you have talented and hellacious women that you could tell us about, either of you from your ancestry? I mean, one of my so my mother said, my mother and her father said that one of my relatives was the outlaw bell star, which just fascinates me to know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I feel like we all have women like that in these books. All three of these books have got, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, I wrote that essay. It's about Nina Simone, but it's also mm -hmm. about the, the singer whom I love. But it's also about my grandmother, who is a songwriter. Um so people can find that. Uh, but yeah, I think I'd be interested. You want to talk about Essie again, maybe, Annette? Or, or, because I feel like you have a lot of that in your work. Yeah, um, what, you know, it's kind of funny. The past two uh, manuscripts I've written, novels I've written, um, have had male protagonists. Um, but the female characters really, 
Um, I think I think they come through as strong, you know, strong personalities. Essie definitely is. Um, there are two female characters in Even As We Breathe, Essie and Leishi, that are both really um, important figures in County's life. Um, I talked a little bit about Essie, but um, what I like about her is that she is, is, you know, kind of a mirror image of County in terms of coming from the same place, being placed in a similar situation. But then um, she's also dealing with issues of gender that we don't get to see that firsthand account of. It's just hinted at. Um, and, um, you know, I think not to give too much away, but you know, some readers want her to fall in love with County um, and they get upset with some of the choices she makes. And I, I'd like to remind them, she's also 19 years old. She's also um, trying to find her way in the world. And there's no reason why she should have to make fewer mistakes than County makes. Um, and so, you know, and I, I just kind of like her, her, um, her curiosity and her, her strong will, even if it leads her maybe in a, a wrong direction sometimes. Um, and then uh, Lucy is super important to me because she is the the grandmother figure, but she's technically um, County's paternal grandmother. And in Cherokee culture, the maternal side is, is more important in familial relationships. But she took on that, that role as a maternal grandmother um, just because that's what County needed. Um, he's had some loss of family members. And um, I like playing with um, with labels and why we choose labels versus um, what is more natural to our relationships. And so Lindsay is this natural maternal figure. And in a lot of ways, she's a sweet Cherokee grandmother that a lot of us knew uh, growing up. But she's, I mean, she's also incredibly um, wise and um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? She, you know, she, there are several layers to her decisions that may not be obvious um, on the forefront. And, um, and so, yeah, she, those, those two characters, uh, and, and they kind of come back together at the end um, and how we um, evolve as women and what our role, how our roles change um, as women. Maybe the hellaciousness is the, what you were saying about how, you know, maybe the reader wants her to make one decision, but she's not gonna do it. And I think that's true of my characters and I know it's true of the women in Karen's mm -hmm. uh, work. And so Karen, are you, where, what's, uh, tell us about some hellaciousness and, and, uh, Okay. Okay. Question, tell us about some hellaciousness. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the the characters in the novel's name is um, Della, Del, Deli, was uh, Deli Wallen, and she is based on a great aunt of mine. And I always admired her so much when I was growing up, particularly when I was in junior high and high school. But she owned a service station and small diner. They were connected. And she worked on cars and, you know, did, you know, worked on engines, <laughs> did all of that. And I just thought that was so powerful, so wonderful. And she became the character in this novel. At the same time, you know, who else was one of my more powerful, hellacious women in my upbringing was um, still, she's still my best friend, Vicki Hayes. She uh, was the first one to uh, show me that what I loved was reading and writing. She wrote poems and uh, songs. She owned a 12 string guitar and she learned to play on her own. No one gave her a lesson ever. And so I had those role models, even if I did not have them in my own uh, family in many ways. So um, I'm really thankful for that. And I'm thankful for how they do influence Miracell Loving in this novel. I mean, she's at the same time that she's sort of lost and uh, seeking her way. She's a powerful woman. At one point, someone read a draft of the novel and they wondered why she'd never married. And I thought, you know, my, one of my objectives then became to set about showing why she had indeed never married. And maybe, I don't know if that's the, you know, the, the end all be all goal, you know. And I, yeah. 
yeah, <laughs> you want to yeah. relate to that, Leah? Well, no, I just think that that's that's kind of why I asked because I think it's this. Well, that because you asked me about that essay, and that was the whole point of that essay was mm -hmm. that you know people want to attach to Appalachia this this narrative. And it tends to be a masculine narrative, or if it's a feminized mm -hmm. narrative, it tends to be very right. traditional. And my experience, and it sounds like y'all's experience, is that these are some complicated women. And these are some, you know, these are, you know, the root of my experience of this place and the root of what I think about when I think about this space is, is not normative kind of behavior, especially mm -hmm. from women and how much that drives what we do. So um, yeah, I just see it all the time. And so it's like a pattern that I notice all the time and I see it in both of your work. So so that was why I wrote an essay. I mean, I love that you know, it, it, it showed me, it raised the question in my consciousness. I mean, let's, let's put aside some of these images that we have from the culture that we were raised in and look at that we're not bringing to the forefront. Can you tell me, I don't have the essay in here in front of me, but I loved, there was a particular line about why, about the mountains. Why are we not looking at the rounded shapes of the mountains? Like the, like the. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, because, you know, I spent, yeah, sorry. I spent uh, years researching the ecology here mm -hmm. and, in order to write the, in order to write Fuckface. And so I was very aware um, that, and I was also reading a lot of literature from the region and it just seemed like nobody was pointing out that, you know, bears are matriarchs in the matriarchal colonies. And like, there's all this stuff that's, th th these trees are not existing on any kind of binary. Like you cannot gender a forest, you can't do it. You know, no. and so I just wonder, I couldn't understand why, what, it's kind of like once you go through the looking glass and you recognize it, you can't understand why other people don't see it, you know? And so all of a sudden I was like, this place is so crazy and so non-binary and, and it's, and why are we not having this conversation about, about why are we not doing what's there? Right, right. And and when we think about rurality, why are we thinking about a pistol? Why are we thinking about a shotgun? Why are we thinking about a pickup truck? Why are we thinking about a straight road through a farm? Why are we thinking about those things? Yes. Why are we thinking about a round sky, a round mountain, birth, um, uh monoecious crops why aren't we thinking about things that that defy because those are the things that make rural the rural experience uh what it is and they're the majority uh, experience for not just people but all species so it's just yeah it's like a i had this little awakening when i was working on the book and i just wanted to write about how uh you know it's not that we don't love our men and it's not that traditional masculinity doesn't have a place um but it's a complicated place that that traditional masculinity lives in. So I wanted, I was trying to, you know, well, I, I love not to whitewash it too, because I think the other thing we do is whitewash Appalachia too much. Well, I love what you said just a second ago that, that writing the essay was an awakening for you. I've been having something like that going on with my work and myself, oddly during this year of the pandemic. I'm, mm. I'm seeing new paths ahead that I have not chosen as a writer. I'm seeing paths ahead of writing about power for myself. I don't know if it's gonna be about my ancestors, but it's a, a power ahead that I have not yet accessed. And so finding that essay spoke to that very place, you know? I'm sort of, that question Annette asked about uh, what do you see as the future for your writing? What topics, genres do you want to explore? I mean, that's it. I want to somehow write from that place of power and uh, that rounded mountains and a, 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 the, the ecology of the body and the psyche and its strength. And I've often written from a place of darkness and loss and mm -hmm. heart because I was raised that way. And I saw that. I saw that in the women I was raised with. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for something new, you know. How yeah, you know, Pancake at Heinemann. We should plug Heinemann because we're all going to be there this year, I hope. Uh, and Pancake asked one time at Heinemann a few years ago, was it at Heinemann? Anyway, let's say it was. She said, well, what are we going to do, y'all? Like, <laughs> here's this. she got to the end of some dark story and she was like, how are we going to fix it? You know, what's the future? And I never forget that. So what's your future, um, 
Annette, what are you, what are you working on? What, where do you think you're going to draw from? Yeah. Well, uh, first I want to say, Karen, I think it's fascinating that in the, it, what is certainly one of the darkest years in memory, <laughs> um, that, that you have found power out of that. That's, um, that's impressive and inspiring and, and maybe the only place to go, right. Um, is, is to, to figure out where that leads us. Um, so, you know, I am, um, in a, maybe in a similar way, uh, my, what I'm working on now is um, a new novel that um, I take uh, traditional Cherokee origin stories and um, kind of uh, gathering the, the values and the themes uh, embedded in those and then translating them into a, a contemporary scenario where I do have a female protagonist um, who is um, grappling with um, issues of land and what to do with land um, and some resistance from, as I told you, I need a place to stay um, from tribal politics. Um, but, but, one of the things that, that that consumes me about this project is looking at these traditional stories and how applicable they are consistently. We know that any great lit literature you can kind of take out of place and time, and um, it, and the messages um, still resonate um, in different scenarios. So that that's true of our origin stories. They speak to our Cherokee values. Even sometimes when we get those values twisted, um, you know, I kind of want to look at, at those things. So this um, concept kind of came to me several years ago. I don't write poetry. Well, I write poetry. I don't share poetry because it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but I had written some poems. My mother passed away of carcinoid cancer um, several years ago. And going through that process, you know, just looking for... Um, you know, just what we tend to do, look for answers, look for a comfort during times like that. And I went back to our origin stories and was, and I was kind of blown away at the, how those um, walked me through that process in a way that I didn't expect. And so going back to those core values that lead our decisions, that lead our path, I think that's always the answer to problem solving if we have the patience to do that. Um, but so, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm headed is like reverse in order to go forward, I think. What about you, Leah? What's on tap for you? I'm not dissimilar to you. I'm doing some like folklore research and writing some retellings. I had a story come out last fall in McSweeney's that was a retelling of Little Red Riding Hood, but from the perspective of the grandmother and she gets to have an affair with the wolf and, you know. Um, so my work is getting kind of speculative in that sense. So um, yeah, I think I'm gonna freak y'all out with whatever I do. I don't think it's gonna be realism, y'all. I don't think it's, I don't know what it is, but uh, it's gonna be different. We'll see, because I just feel like, you know, what's, yeah, I want to look at breaking open some boundaries in, in terms of regional literature, especially. What about you, Karen? Well, um, after all these, you know, I have, the memoir has been out for a long time now. Um, the memoir about my um, self as a birth mother, my surrender of my son, and eventually finding my son. For a long time, I thought the next memoir would be about finding him and the experience of getting to know him. But I don't think that's what it's going to be at all. I think that this next work is, oh, how to, how to describe it? I was talking uh, just this last week was at the West Virginia Wesleyan College's low residency week all on Zoom. And I was talking about this on there. I, it's just, you know, that Richard and Linda Thompson song called uh, When the Spell is Broken? And I love that title of that song. It's like some spell of the past and of being weighed down is broken in me. And new work is coming to me in nonfiction. There's going to be a, a new memoir, but it's not about what I thought it was going to be. It's going to be about faith and opening. And I don't mean faith in a traditional sense, y'all. It's not about Jesus. 
it's faith about, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry, not, now I've, oh my God. Can I blurb it and can I just say that? Carol Taylor Beckenberg, it's not about Jesus. <laughs> um, it's not describing very much what I mean, but it's hard when the work is just beginning to open up inside you. I know it's going to be about faith and it's going to be about transformation. And again, not in the the traditional ways I was raised at all. And it, so I'm turning back to a kind of home in myself of nonfiction and memoir. You know, and I've also been writing a lot of essays. I have a, a probably a book's worth of new personal essays and I need to put those in some form and order. So those are the new the new things ahead. Y'all, do we need to look at the chat or something and see if anybody's got any questions? Oh. I was actually I was about to hop back up. I was hearing that y'all wrap up um oh, about yeah, future we're work. So yeah, maybe we can devote about ten minutes to any audience questions. I know people have places to be. Um but I don't. We have a few questions in from people, um, and I bet we'll get a few more. Um, let's see. The first one is um, from Nancy, who asks, uh, did any of y'all think of young adults as your intended readers? Uh I, I'll I'll start real quick because I did when I was writing I wasn't thinking I was writing you know YA um, necessarily but I teach high school um, and so I think constantly in in my head is is this a book that I could teach um, you know would this speak um, to my students and certainly because I chose a younger protagonist um, who is in a lot of ways. Um, somebody I feel like I've taught every single year, you know, that I've been a teacher um, that, you know, it is a very much like a coming of age story. And I think that it's um, appropriate for, for different ages. It wasn't my intent to necessarily write um, YA, but I think just because I'm a high school teacher, it's, it is always um, top of mind. I have not had that experience. I have not written YA. I sometimes have uh, desires to write books for children, and I have a desire to write them in with collaboratively. A, a wonderful friend of mine, uh, Carlisle Petit, uh, is a printmaker and does wonderful work, graphic work. I have a real desire to make something with her that would be for children, but that, that would be the most I could answer that. Leia? Yeah, I don't think that a book called Fuck Face is really for the younger reader. I don't know if that was, I don't think that was where it was. However, I will say that when I was, you know, <laughs> that age, when I was that age, I read a mixture of books, and, and I think that, that there are a lot of books that kind of inadvertently become popular as YA books because they're because they're accessible to to that wherever your brain is when you're 15 or whatever you know so it, it doesn't surprise me that all three of these books might might appeal to YA readers because because there are some coming of age issues in all three of them and there's some you know some reckoning with self that that I think a lot of younger people really identify with so um, and they're very highly readable I mean I really I breeze through both these novels so with y'all so um, yeah that's just a plug for anybody who's teaching to just you know plan your semester around the three of us and <laughs> well and, and I should say uh, I hope there are no parents online but I should say that Leia visited one of my classes and they yeah. did read two of her short stories from Fuckface. And I had to have a talk of maturity with them beforehand. But <laughs> seniors in my AP, so that uh, I kind of got away with that. But um, and they loved it. And we had great discussion about craft um, using two of her essays or two of her uh, short stories. I mean, I'm at. I could also say that my mem my older book, my memoir, Surrendered Child. Oh, uh, Surrendered Child. I, mean, I was fifteen during six mm -hmm. the time of that experience, but I have had 
some people who work with um, <laughs> college, young college age students even saying, well, we don't know if this book is appropriate or not, which is a really a complex thing. I mean, isn't that what they need to be reading? So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a wonderful story for younger people to read. Now, I think there were too, um, too much drugs, rock and roll or something in there. <laughs> oh, no. How will the young people find out about drugs and rock and roll? If they I, I cannot <laughs> imagine. I mean, I really, it's, I, it's never so available. I'm missing it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we have another question here um, from Tamara who says, what are the pros and cons of labeling yourselves as Appalachian writers? Um, is that a, a label that y'all um, hmm. intentionally place on yourselves? And what have you found to be the benefits and the consequences of doing that? Annette, do you want to try that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I don't know that we get to choose, you know, that label or not. I think it kind of uh, immediately tags us, um, as, you know, probably, you know, Karen and I both are, our latest novels are published with University Press of Kentucky. So that is almost like an automatic um, label in a lot of people's eyes. There's, for me, there's a ton of pros um, in terms of the writing community of Appalachia, Um I, I am just floored by the genuine support of Appalachian writers um, yes. from prior to publication through the whole process. I cannot, cannot say enough. And again, you mentioned Hyman in the Appalachian Writers um, Workshop, and I think a lot of that's connected to that workshop, but just even um, as it extends out. Um, so that, that's a huge benefit. Um, downsides i mean just you know any category you know native american literature gets siphoned in, in, to one place and appalachian literature does as well um i was, I was talking to somebody uh the other day and, and i'm curious what you guys what your experience has been with this i have not been that i have noticed that often referred to as a southern writer though um i've been a, you know an appalachian writer native american writer um, but I, I find that interesting. Last time I checked, the, North Carolina was in the South and I, you know, so I, I, I find that fascinating. So I don't know what your experiences are. Well, I mean, I, in, in terms of the difficulties, I mean, I go back to my time in graduate school and creative writing programs and, I remember being told by one professor, well, you might want to be, you know, don't don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't, you know, narrow your horizons or whatever he might have said in terms of being a regional writer. But you know, my motives for things and my way of approaching things is always uh, grounded in the heart. That's how I do things. I do things intuitively. I do things because they are real to me and mean something to me. And that's naturally where my work comes from. And that and I'm I'm just really, really proud to be an Appalachian woman. I am so proud of it. And I'm um I say the same thing about my book coming from University Press of Kentucky. I'll echo what Annette has said. I'm just thrilled to be a representative of a voice from our region. Leah, what about you? Yeah, I think I've been lumped in more as a southern writer. Um because my I'm with Henry Holt, which is out of New York. And so they just go, and then this bottom half of the country where none of us live, that's where all the books are from, you know, and I get kind of put in that group sometimes, but I think it's just because people don't know how to really talk about my work because it's, it, it's, it's also a short story collection, which is operating differently in the reader's mind. You know, it's not like a novel. It's more like listening to an album and um, but I think everything is regional. And that's always my response. If anybody has a couple of times I've had people, you know, I've had like interviewers or, or people that were covering the book say things like, oh, these people are so three dimensional, your characters. And I'm like, well, do you think we're two dimensional normally? Like, what does that even mean? So um, I'm just always really careful to say that everything is regional, right? Like New York City is a region. 
And if you're writing about New York, that's a region. So everybody's a regional writer. And um, and it's just a question of what the what the reader brings to to the book in terms of their understanding or their thinking about region. And if you if you are a person who is has a tendency to um, um, rank regions, well, then maybe we need to have a conversation before you read my book, right? Because or any of these books, because why are you ranking regions? And if you rank the urban above the, the the rural, or if you rank the, you know, the black South above the white South, or, or, or rather the white South above black South, because there's not enough books about the black South. Um, but, you know, anything that is, that is erasing the people that are, that are in a, a place, I think is, uh, that's on the reader. And so I try to be not confrontational, but maybe pushy about, um, uh, think differently as you, you know, as you go into this space that is three dimensional and is incredibly diverse and has all different kinds of people and is and is no more or less regional than a book about Los Angeles. You know, I mean, my job as a good writer, I think, is to write complexly, to write uh, people in all their varieties, all their roundness as characters, all their total complexities as human beings, and also writing where they come from. Mm -hmm. you know? That's my job. Well, to um, what Leah was just, Leah, sorry, what Leah was just talking about. Um, uh, sorry, it's just uh, <laughs> I'm not used to it yet. Um, someone has a question. I think you mentioned a little bit about having grown up, or at least spent part of your 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 uh, life away from Appalachia, what kind of insights that has given you in, in your writing? Um, if you'd like to say a little bit more about that, um, that's a question from Becca. Yeah, so I was, um, my father was in the military, my mother's British, and so I'm like Karen, I've moved a bunch of times when I was a kid, I grew up all of, mostly all over North Carolina, but then also I lived in Europe until I was in elementary school. And I came to the States, uh, you know, I can remember being in third grade and not understanding what anybody was saying to me and not understanding what was happening and um, people thinking I talked funny and uh, so I got rid of that accent real quick. And then, um, uh, I don't know, I think it's just, you know, anybody who has, comes from a, a family where it's a little bit different or you have some diversity in your in your background you know I code switch um, uh, I my I, I run into things all the time foods and words that I use that I think are I have the thing all the time where I think oh well that's a really Appalachian word and it turns out it's like cockney slang because I just learned it when I was a kid and I never learned where the word came from you know that happens to me all the time so my brain is just always inside and outside, inside and outside of, of the place I'm, I'm working with. Um, but yeah, I was uh, uh, definitely not settled here until I was in my late teens. We came to Asheville when I was in my late teens. But my, my father's family, we visited my father's family in Kentucky all the time. Hmm. Yeah, I can definitely see how, that's actually really funny to think about um, commonalities or or mis, uh, misappropriations of English and uh, mm -hmm. Appalachian. It's, it's funny to think about. Um, all right. It looks like that is the last question that we've got. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I know we're over time anyway. Um, before we close out the event, I just want to give a quick few reminders. If you'd like to order copies of Even As We Breathe, Fuck Face, or Wanting Radiance, those are all available from Flyleaf. There's a, a link just below our faces. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, if you missed some of the event or you'd like to share it with a friend, you can use the same link. As soon as we wrap up, it'll convert into a video. And then please do check out our calendar of upcoming events as well. We've got a lot of fun things lined up for the rest of the winter and the spring and we're adding more all the time so we we really hope you can join us for some of those future events thank you again so much to annette karen leah it's been a 
really fascinating conversation. I'm so lucky to have hosted you all tonight. I'm really appreciative of y'all joining us. Thank you, Talia. Thanks everybody for coming. This was great. great. Annette, you're coming to my basement. Karen, you're coming over. We're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a retreat. Let's do we it. One another in the flesh and in the real time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get vaccinated. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone um, and everyone to watching. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.